my name is Jenny, and I'm a mechanical engineer. And more than that, actually, I'm a mechanical engineering professor. And it's one of the great pleasures of my life that I get to inspire other people to become engineers. And one of the things that I tell my students, and I teach freshmen all the way to seniors, is that the core of engineering is not all of this technical knowledge that I'm like cramming into their heads, okay? It's not uh, beam deflection and the Young's modulus of stainless steel. The core of engineering is really problem solving. This is why it frustrates me when I put on my administrator hat, and I don't like to do that too often, but I put on my administrator hat and I sit with my fellow engineering educators and we sit down to tackle one of the most pressing problems in engineering, which is gender diversity, and we stop thinking like engineers. We throw out the core of our profession when we're trying to tackle this issue. So, how should we be solving this problem? Let me introduce that first. As engineers, we have a process for problem solving. And if you know any engineers, I'm sure that's really surprising to you that we have a process for it, okay? So I'm gonna show you a flow diagram, all right? So the way that this process works, it's called the engineering design process. You start by defining the problem at hand. You set up some targets, right? You set up targets for what success would look like with your designed solution. Then, you brainstorm and you narrow down your concepts and you come up with three or four unique and viable concepts that could potentially solve your problem. You go through then and make rational decisions about which of these concepts you should advance into a design. Designing takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time and energy, so you want to be careful on which design you choose to move forward. Then you build it out. You build yourself a prototype, it could be a product, it could be a process, it could be a piece of software, and you test it. You test it to those metrics that you laid out all the way in the beginning, right? And hopefully it works out, and you got yourself a solution. You succeed on your test, Waha! we have ourselves a solution, right? This is great. This only happens like 0.01% of the time. As somebody who's designed a lot of things, okay, you fail. Right? And what happens is you gotta go back and you gotta test again, okay? So you test, you fail a test, you go back to the drawing board, you tweak a little couple, couple things with your design, all right, and you go again, and again, and again, and again, okay? And eventually, eventually, your design might get there. That concept that you chose to move forward might find the eventual solution, right? But there's something that happens in engineering more often than we like to admit. And that's that we picked the wrong concept to begin with. We picked the wrong concept to invest all of this time and energy. And when we do that, we get stuck in what I like to call the cycle of death, okay? We're stuck in an endless design test cycle that's never gonna get us to our eventual solution because we need to be doing something radically different. So what we have to do in this moment as engineers is we have to stop and we have to go back to the drawing board, and it's really tough, okay, because we've put all this energy into it. We've mortgaged our parents' house to do it, okay? But you gotta stop, because you're never gonna get there with this idea. And you gotta pick another idea and advance that through to design and go through the testing all over again and hopefully find the solution. Okay, that's the engineering design process. That's the way that we should be tackling the problem of gender diversity in engineering. Let's apply it for a second, okay? Let's start by defining the problem. I'm gonna put some numbers out there. It's another thing we engineers just love to do, okay? So, wham, pie chart. Okay, we generate each and every year in this country, we graduate about 107,000 bright-eyed, bushy-tailed engineers out into the world. And those engineers are primarily concentrated in three core disciplines. These are also the disciplines that have the largest job market, believe it or not. There's mechanical engineering, civil engineering, and electrical engineering. A lot of the newer, more interdisciplinary majors, they are fantastic. I also teach in some of those. But they constitute less than 25% of the total engineering population in terms of graduation. So I want you to remember this chart as I show you the next bit of data, which is where are the women in engineering? The women in engineering are concentrated in three core disciplines, environmental engineering, biomedical engineering, and chemical engineering. 
In those three disciplines, they've actually reached what we consider, or actually what our sociologist friends, they know a lot more about human behavior than we do, okay? They consider to be a critical mass. Critical mass is about 30% female. If you reach that number, it's self-sustaining, right? We, we, have to, we don't have to put as much energy into recruiting women in. Environmental, biomedical, and chemical have reached that threshold. The three core disciplines that graduate the most engineers fall far, far short of that critical mass target. Civil engineering is the closest to the target at a whopping 20% female. And my own discipline of mechanical engineering battles it out for the bottom of the barrel with electrical at 12% female nationally. All right? Those are some depressing numbers. Now, this problem has been around for a long, long time. And because it's been around for a long time and the distribution has looked like this, and because the three biggest disciplines don't have enough women, the total percentage of female in engineering for the past 50 years, okay, has remained very low. So here we are, we're looking at percentage female graduates in engineering from 1960s up until the present. You can see there was a nice little jump. We can thank Women's Lib for that, okay? Nice little jump in the late 70s into the early 80s. We went from pretty much nothing, okay, up to 20%. And we've held there since the late 80s until the present. Every year, we engineering educators put another dot on this chart, and it fluctuates between like 18 and 22, okay? We are not moving the needle. And this is super frustrating, people. It is super frustrating considering more women are going into STEM in general. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math, okay? So let's look at another STEM field. Let's look at the biosciences. Okay, the biosciences saw a similar jump. Now they had a higher baseline to start with in the 60s, but they also jumped up in the 70s, and they continued to grow in percentage female up until the present, present when you, there's actually an overrepresentation of women in the biosciences. Why is this happening? There are no women in engineering, there are lots of women in the biosciences. Well, there's two things going on. First, we know a bit now that women are sort of naturally drawn to disciplines with immediate societal impact. The fact that all engineering disciplines have immediate societal impact is beside the point, right? It's more evident in engineering disciplines with a bio or enviro prefix to it. The other thing is there's a huge amount of pop culture that's behind this, right? If you look at all the imagery of women going into medicine, okay, all through the past 30 years, that's, that's huge, that's a huge driver of these trends. And then consider what we put out there as a culture in terms of engineering. I know he's a physicist, all right? I know he's a physicist, but most people can't tell the difference, all right? You could not ask for a worse PR campaign for the cause of engineering than somebody with questionable social skills, okay? Um, we don't need more of that, all right? So, so. What are we doing about it? Well, we have been trying to solve this problem, guys, for 30 years. We have been really putting a lot of time and energy into this. And as a case in point, I'm gonna show you some examples, okay? What would it look like if you have a daughter right now? I don't have a daughter, I have a niece and she's super cute. So I'm gonna take this as, a, as an opportunity to show her. This is Macy, okay? <laughs> Macy is, Macy's almost two, okay? She's a potential engineer. All right, and then she wants to become like her Aunt Jen Jen, okay, and, and become a mechanical engineer. What, what's going to happen to Macy as she grows up? What kind of programming is she going to be exposed to that's trying to push her in this direction? Well, we start off, we've got some wonderful gendered construction toys. Okay, and, and say what you want about this, all right? It's definitely out there, all right? And I think it does something. There's also tons of programming, right? Take your daughter to work day, introduce a girl to engineering day, Girl Scouts is in on the game, okay? There's, there's engineering badges and all kinds of stuff, all right? Then you've got great organizations. Girls Who Code is fantastic, right? You've got summer camps at universities. I've got an organization that's trying to do this, right? And it kind of steps its way up as this child is going through school. And by the time she gets to high school, if she is seriously considering doing engineering as a college major, we start to bring in national organizations, Society of Women Engineers, WePAN, NSF gets in on the game as soon as you're in college, right? 
massive, massive amount of time and energy and funding that's going into it, and it's so well-intentioned. Every women engineers conference that I go to, we put up Rosie the Riveter and we say, yeah, girls, you can do it. You can do it, you can become an engineer, except we're not doing it, right? <laughs> we are not doing it, okay? This is not working, all right? So let's go back to that design process. It's time to admit that what we've been trying for 30 years isn't working. It's not working and we can continue to beat our heads against the wall for another 30 years, but are we, we're just adding another dot, 18 to 22%, okay? Mechanical's down there at 12, all right? So we need to do something fundamentally different. We need to go back, pick another concept, advance it through to design, test it, and hopefully reach that solution. So let's engineer diversity for a second. We have learned a few things from 30 years worth of work in this area. I'm going to say two important things, two important bits of data here. The first is that nationally, on average, we don't lose women any more than we lose men once they make the decision to go into engineering. Say what you will about the retention rate that I'm about to quote you, that's another TED talk, okay? But men and women are retained from freshman through to graduation in college engineering majors at 60%. 60% of your freshman class is going to graduate, whether you're a man or you're a woman, okay? So no difference in retention. The second bit of information that we know is that at the start of the college pipeline, there are equal numbers of men and women who are ready to go into engineering. Case in point, what we consider one of the most important characteristics of a potential engineer is math literacy, okay, and math skill. And if we take AP calculus scores as an indicator of that, we see equal numbers, people, equal numbers of men and women scoring a four or a five on the calculus AB exam nationally. There are 50,000 men and 50,000 women. That would qualify them for calculus credit in college, Calc 1, and it's also a good indicator of whether or not you're going to succeed in an engineering major. If we consider Calc 2, it's, it's actually interesting. This data is from 2015, okay? Uh, the ladies actually outperform the dudes, okay, in Calc 2. So, so we have more women than men getting a four or five. What this tells me is that there's essentially 50 to 65,000 potential female engineers out there each and every year. 50 to 65,000 who have the aptitude for going into engineering. So, let's put some engineering skills to use here, okay? We're gonna do a little math. It's really complicated. We're gonna do multiplication and division, so bear with me, okay? So, we have 107,000 engineering graduates every year. If we incorporate our retention rate of a whopping 60%, we need to recruit 180,000 men and women as college freshmen in engineering classrooms, 180,000. If we then put our critical mass target of 30% female on there, we get 54,000 female recruits. That's what we need each and every year entering college classrooms. This is an interesting number, okay? It's interesting because remember what I quoted you for the AP Calc scores. There's 50 to 65,000 potential female engineers each and every year. It's also interesting if you look at this number relative to the number of high schools in the United States. There are 26,000 public high schools and another like dozen or so, 12,000 12, private high schools. If each public high school in the US graduated two, two females to go into engineering, we would hit this target. I think that's possible, okay? This is, we're not stretching this too far here. All right, so where, where are these girls going? Where are these girls going if they're not going into engineering? Well, they're going into the biosciences, okay? The female talent is going into the biosciences. So if I am to look out into a Calculus I class in college, 43% of the females that I see in that class are going into the biosciences. Only 14% are going into engineering. For the males in the class, it's the exact opposite. 
38% are going into engineering with only 9% going into biosciences. Okay, so if I'm suggesting a solution here, am I suggesting that we steal female talent from the biosciences? Yes, yes I am suggesting that we steal female talent from the biosciences. Okay, because the messaging that those women are receiving to go into the biosciences, a lot of it is, you can save the world as, as a doctor, right? Well, I save the world every day as an engineer. I design medical devices, okay? So our messaging is off. So let's think for a second about some potential concepts here. I wanna, I wanna leave you with some hope, and I also wanna point out a couple organizations that I think are doing this correctly, that we could use as models for what our eventual design solution will be. Full disclosure here, guys, I am involved with these organizations that I'm going to show you. I am not paid by them, okay? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fangirl and a volunteer, all right? So we're going to start with, uh, I got to give a shout out to the National Academy of Engineers, okay? The National Academy of Engineers, very prestigious organization. They realize that they've had a, a PR problem, okay? It's not okay to keep saying we're Sheldon, all right? So, they have done a really great job of promoting the message that engineers are problem solvers and engineers are solving the world's most essential problems. Engineers are focused on security, on healthcare, and on sustainability. Those are the grand challenges of engineering that are most pressing. So they've helped us reframe the field of engineering. We also have programs like my own. I, I uh, run a nonprofit organization called the Perry Initiative, which, quite frankly, steals female talent shamelessly from the biosciences. Okay, so we take girls who are interested in medicine, who are interested in biology, and we show them all the engineering that's involved in developing the tools that go into medicine. And it's, been, it's tremendous. It's like empowerment through power tools. So we reach about 1,500 girls per year all across the country. And what we've found to be the most valuable is actually this curriculum, this idea that we can influence college major choice by showing them the possibilities in engineering. There's also a great organization called Project Lead the Way, PLTW. Project Lead the Way is operating on a scale nationally that has the potential to actually recruit those 54,000 females. PLTW is curriculum that is engineering themed for elementary, middle, and high school classes that's taught by actual elementary, middle, and high school teachers. So it's happening during the school day. It reaches 2.4 million kids in all 50 states. So if PLTW gets the messaging right to the females sitting in those classrooms, we have some hope. Another point on the policy side, there's been a lot of great progress with the next generation science standards. NGSS was developed by representatives from about 40 states and it's been adopted so far in 16 of them. It explicitly incorporates engineering theory and engineering practice into the science classroom. So this is like uh, the common core, but for science. And they have chosen engineering as the theme through which to teach a lot of science. So we've got a lot of hope here that at least kids are aware of this discipline called engineering and aware of the problem solving potential that comes with it. So what needs to happen now, folks, is that we need to advance these concepts. We need to take what we're learning in terms of innovative curriculum and programming and scale it up through some of these existing entities so that we can reach that target, that target of 54,000 females and eventually solve this problem. We need to invest our time and our energy in organizations that have the potential to solve this. These summer camps with 20 girls at a time, when you send a female engineer off into a high school classroom, these are all well-intentioned, but they're not fixing the bigger problem. 54,000 females going into this discipline nationally is totally, totally achievable. We can fill that gap. But in order to do that, we have to think like engineers and we must engineer the diversity that we wanna see. Thank you.